And what I'm going to do today is share with you the roadmap that I have designed to unravel a couple's survival knot. I'm going to divide my presentation today in two parts. In part one, I will be giving you the context in which I guide a couple to arrive at the point where they can unravel the survival knot in their relationship. In part two, I will share with you the actual roadmap. So here we go. First of all, the context is that I see couples for two full days, nine to six, nine to six, both days, so that I can take all the time that is needed to really allow for this transformational climate to occur. And I'm making a distinction between Kairos and Kronos. Kronos, clock time, Kairos, organic time, the way babies are born. And so let me start with how I prepare myself for a session. So on the day that I'm going to meet a new couple for a two-day intensive journey, I get up in the morning and I make sure that I feel deeply grateful for being alive. I pull out my enthusiasm box from under my bed, the one that says, wow, how exciting is it that I am here alive and well and breathing. I go to the mirror and I can really bring my arms up and say, I am back. And I also look at my husband, Yumi, because it is such a privilege to be in a relationship, to be partners, to be on a journey together, to learn and become more and more relationally conscious. And so before I see a couple, I want to really enter into the full experience of my aliveness and our aliveness as a couple, because that's really what I'm going to transmit to the couple ultimately is for them to be able to enter into this gratitude of being alive and of being in connection. And then I go to the room where I do my work and I prepare the room. I really clear the space. I clean the plants and cut off the dead parts and I clean the carpet if it needs it and the chairs and I bless the chairs and I sit and I take a moment to really know the privilege it is for me to be able to welcome a couple and guide them. And I prepare a big notebook for myself and two smaller notebooks for the couple with nice pens and in my notebook, I write their name and the date. And I take a moment to really enter into seeing their names, touching their names, looking at the date. So, yes, today is the day. And by the time the couples come, I'm just so excited to see them that a lot of this enthusiasm that's really mine comes out as I welcome them. And for some couples, that is a lot too much. That is just too much excitement, too much enthusiasm, too much energy. But I know that I am not the one who's going to join them. They are going to join me on a journey in the direction of liberation. And we sit down, and for a while I'm just quiet, I look at them, and I allow the three of us to arrive, just breathing, looking, because I'm gonna ask a question. And it is a fateful question, and I don't wanna put anything in the space between us before I put that question there. And here is the question I ask. If our journey could lead you to what you want the most for your relationship, 
if your deepest aspiration could come true, in, if the longing that lives in your heart could be realized, what is it? And I'm going to give you each of you three wishes, and we're going to stay with those wishes till on the horizon we actually have six, six big wishes. And then I wait, and when the first person begins to talk, I listen till there are three dreams, wild dreams on the horizon for that person. And the one thing that I teach is the distinction between the language of deficit and the language of abundance. Because sometimes we say, I'd like for our relationship to be less painful. Well, the word painful is a word from the language of deficit. But what do we really want in the language of abundance? I would like for our relationship to be nourishing and flourishing and open and, and giving. So that piece of learning that distinction is very important because the language of abundance is the only one we can talk when we put dreams on the horizon. And this concept of putting dreams on the horizon comes from a wonderful methodology, an organizational methodology called appreciative inquiry. And appreciative inquiry says, change happens with the first question you ask. If your first question is, what is your problem? That's the direction in which the energy is going to go. And if your first question is, what is your wildest dream? That's the direction in which the journey is going to go. And I've chosen to start there. And another reason that I like to start there is because when I listen to people's dreams, I get to meet their essence. And I don't want to start the journey without knowing deeply who am I dealing with? What is the soul of the person? Where does the poetry of the person lives? Where do their longings and dreams live? And that allows me to know the two people who have come to journey with me. And so this particular part can take an hour and a half, two hours. We are in Kairos time, it's organic. And I won't move on till I have six powerful, life-affirming, life-giving dreams on the horizon. This particular process already has the three of us in a dimension that is deeply emotional because often tears come to the surface just from verbalizing at the deepest level a wish that maybe has lived for a long time inside of me, but I've not been able to language it. Now, when uh, the couple lets me know they're going to come to me, I write to them one thing, bring pictures of your children. And at that point, when we have six dreams on the horizon, I will ask the couple to take out the pictures of their children because I say, the children are watching us and taking pictures. The brain is always taking pictures and they're taking pictures for their inner album. And right now, let's put them out there because they'll be watching this whole entire journey, which is a legacy to them. So, for example, six powerful, deep, nourishing dreams are a legacy to the children. And so we put the children out there, and sometimes I will even say, so what's one essential quality of each one of those beautiful children? And then the children are there, the children who watch us. And I tell a story, once upon a time a little girl was born. Once upon a time, a little boy was born and everything that has emerged to the surface about their life, so much comes out when we say a dream, that becomes then part of the story that I tell. And then they got married. 
and they had three children. And things were good and things were bad and things were easy and things were hard. And I put in some of the hardship also that has occurred, maybe some of the deep, deep crises. And I tell them, and then I say one of the, one day suddenly, they came to see a woman by the name of Heidi Schleifer. And she said to them, what are your wildest dreams for this relationship? And here is what they said. And I read back within that narrative, that very big narrative, I add now the six dreams that they have put on the horizon. And what's so beautiful about telling it in the third person is that the story that comes out is an archetypical story. It's the story of couples all over time that is woven in all of our fiber. We know the stories of couples. And what's really very liberating is that the couple isn't anymore a couple who's come with a problem or a crisis or a tough, tough conflict, but a couple among couples, among couples for centuries who really have dreamt big and would love to be able to, dream, to live the dream. And then I give them their two little books and at each juncture, I will have them write four things. One, something I learned from our conversation. I learned it. I didn't know it coming in. It's new to me. Something I've relearned. I knew it, but now just from this conversation, I know it much more deeply. Something that completely surprised me and something that now intrigues me. And I gave the couple a chance to digest that first step of the journey, the step of the wildest dreams and deepest aspirations. And we go through the learning, the relearning, we go through the surprises and the intrigues. My second step with a couple is that I want to identify what is their survival dance. And by survival dance, I actually don't mean the content of it. I mean the process of it. And this is the way I do it. I tell them that I would like to give them a guiding principle. And that the only way I can give them this guiding principle is if they are willing to have their toughest conversation, their most loaded conversation, their most embarrassing conversation, but just for 13 minutes, one, three. And at 13 minutes, I'm going to go stop. And they stop in the middle of a word, or even if they're winning for the first time, they stop. And then from that conversation, we will build a guiding principle. And that is what occur. I say stop after 13 minutes. And what's really amazing is that all of us as humans have in our brain a place that allows us to externalize our own behavior. We can be observers of the very behavior we exhibit. And I say to the couple, you've been to a restaurant and there was this couple. And they told you, listen, this couple come from the, comes from another planet. The planet is called Wygelia. So they're Wygelians and they speak the language Wygelian. You didn't understand a word they were saying. But you watched them. And what did you see? And of course, we people watch all the time. And we don't know what people are saying. But we can see their facial expression. We can see the, their gestures. We can see their... The, the, the climate between them and every single couple, because we've got that part in our brain, can actually step out of the very conversation, become observers, and be, begin to describe the pattern they see. The woman, for example, is just speaking louder and louder and she gets very emotional and the man seems to be shrinking and he's got less and less words and she's got more and more words and her, her voice is louder and his voice is smaller and there's a big wall in the middle and a little hole in the middle and they're peering through that wall. It seems that at, 
every description of the Wygelian couple, the same survival pattern seems to emerge in which one energy becomes much bigger, expanded, and then the other energy becomes much smaller, constricted. And the couple begins to describe it. And by the time the description becomes funny, like one of them says, you know what, that couple really needs help. It always becomes funny. Or the waiter really never wants to come to that table. There's so much toxicity there. The, the, the description becomes funny, then we can stop. And I can say to them, welcome to the club. There's a universal club of couples who are in a survival dance where one energy is big and one energy is constricted. And you are part of that universal club, welcome. However, I can now give you a guiding principle. And it is that this survival dance will always disconnect you. You can count on it. Because in the middle space, there is a wall or there is a glass panel or there is a fire or there is a vortex sucking in energy. All these metaphors don't come from me. They come from the couple who suddenly sees a survival dance they've been in for years and years and years. And so once that's established, the guiding principle be be becomes that dance, which you share with every single couple around the globe, that dance will always disconnect you. It's reactive and automatic, and it is lodged in the reptilian brain that only has two settings, fight, flight. So. What does connect you? And this is where I give the couple the description of the three invisible connectors. The first connector is that, that relational space between the two of you, which isn't visible, but is palpable. And you've just described it. It has a fire. It has a wall. The waiter doesn't want to come there because there's so much toxicity. That's the relational space. And we all know it. We can come to friends who've just had a fight and they love us. Hello, hello. But we can feel the toxicity in the space between. And so I explained to the couple not only about the space between, but that our children play in that space. The space between the couple is the playground of the child. And so that is the first invisible connector and our full responsibility, each of us 100%, to take full responsibility for the quality of the space between us. It is based on Martin Buber, the philosopher who said, our relationships live in the space between us and that space is sacred. And so the first learning of the invisible connector is the sanctity of the space between us, which is our res responsibility. In Hebrew, a family, is Migdash Me'at, a small sanctuary. It really points to the sanctification of the climate between us. The second invisible connector is a bridge between one world and the other world. When we are a couple, we're incompatible. Only incompatible people fall in love with each other so they can learn from each other. And so, we need a bridge that connects between the two worlds so we can cross and learn the culture, the language, the music, the rhythm. When the sun sets and, and rises in that other world. And so the bridge is the second invisible connector. And our job is to cross that bridge with new eyes. Like the French poet Marcel Proust said, that the adventure of life is not the discovery of new landscapes, 
but the capacity to see the old ones with new eyes. The third invisible connector is what Martin Buber, the philosopher, calls the encounter. It's that magical time when we feel profoundly connected to each other. That time when suddenly time disappears. We have it sometimes with music. We just melt into the music and it's, we are one with it. Or in nature, we melt into the nature and we are one. And we've experienced it with our partner. But we've been accidental tourists there. We don't know how we get in there. We don't know how we get yanked out of there. And the third invisible connector is our capacity to live in the zone of the encounter as human beings. And so when we honor the space and we cross the bridge, we create the conditions for the encounter. Once I've taught this basic principle, what disconnects you is the survival dance, what connects you is the embrace of three invisible connectors, I asked the couple, if I can be their teacher. Because the contract between us hasn't been made yet. It is only made when I've outlined where we're going and that they agree, okay, teach us. And so the question really is a serious one. Can I be your guide? Can I be your teacher? And only when I get a big yes from both people, we start. And the beginning of my teaching of the, the, uh, the real connection is to teach them three metaphors. One, the art of hosting. How do I take you in? How do I tell my truth? How can I be vulnerable, authentic, and naked so that not only can you get to know me, but I get to know me better because you showed up. The art of hosting. Another metaphor, the art of visiting. How do I leave the world I live in, the known, but also my perceptions and my projections and my story and my past? How do I leave that world? and walk the bridge in the present, the present, the present, the present, and land in the present, in the world of my partner with new eyes so that I can learn them really. With a beginner's mind, as the Zen Buddhists say, a mind that doesn't know you. How can I visit you that way? Two metaphors. And the third metaphor is the metaphor of the neighborhoods of our world. There are many, many neighborhoods in our expanding world. Our world is growing because we are growing, expanding, maturing. And there are many, many neighborhoods, some we don't even know, some we love, some are tough neighborhoods. And so in giving them that that metaphor of the neighborhoods, I'm beginning the preparation to ultimately visit the toughest neighborhood in the relationship in each one of us, where these meet, which is the survival knot. And so we begin to visit over the bridge and the first neighborhood that I invite couples to, to visit, I call a precious neighborhood where I feel passionate and vital and alive, and where I feel like this is me, this is my essence. And people have many, many precious neighborhoods. It could be fatherhood or motherhood. It can be my job, it can be mountain climbing, it can be a special spot in the world that nourishes my soul in, in ways that nothing else does. There are many precious neighborhoods. And the reason I start with a precious neighborhood is because there are our resources and our strengths. And I like the couple to start by knowing the resources and strengths that are in the relationship because we are then also going to visit 
the toughest neighborhood. And it's better to go to what's tough with your resources and strength than depleted by conflict. And so we start there. And we establish the bridge. The bridge gets established by coming very, very close at 18 inches, eyeball to eyeball, with a soft face that says, I'm grateful to be here with you. And that 18 inches gazing in each other's eyes establishes what is called the limbic resonance, two limbic systems resonating together, which allows for the central nervous system to calm down. So establishing the bridge, this very close looking at each other, holding hands and letting the language of the skin speak, that establishment of the bridge is a way to quiet down the central nervous system so we can begin the visit from a peaceful, centered, aligned place. And so I stay with a couple establishing the bridge till they experience this natural biological regulation of their central nervous system. And they visit the precious neighborhood. One of them as a host, the host invites the visitor. And when you host, you speak the truth, which means that every one of your sentences is five words or less. The truth is very short. Anything else just covers the truth. So the host is learning to tell their truth in that neighborhood and basically learns to go to the core essence of what they are really attempting to say. And when you speak truth, you'll notice that if somebody is fully present and really there with you and that the limbic resonance is occurring, you will be calm enough to discover layers of yourself that you didn't know before the visit. So hosting isn't just saying the truth you know, it's also discovering the truth you don't yet know. The visitor comes over and they learn to bring their full essence in the present. Visiting is an opportunity to be in the now, 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 and allow our own world and our whole history to disappear in the distance and learn what it's like to give our generative listening to the other person. My whole self listens to your whole self. When those two visits are done, I now have the criteria whether I can take this couple into the toughest neighborhood. And the criteria is the following. It's two of them. One, are they able to host and to visit well? Some couples are. And those are the couples with whom I can go to the unraveling of the survival knots. The couples who are not are the couples who then need my guidance in deepening their capacity to visit and to host in the various neighborhoods of their world, but not yet in the toughest one. That's one criteria. And the other one is if their dreams are aligned. Because if a couple doesn't have aligned dreams, one wants to be in the relationship, one wants to leave the relationship in the most dignified way, that isn't the, the unraveling, isn't the map I will, dis, uh, I will design for them. They need something quite different. But the couple who fits the bill is the couple who on day two is going to go to the unraveling, which I am now going to present to you. At the end of day one, I'll make a drawing of two worlds, two circles that are expanding with, with arrows, a bridge between them and the precious neighborhoods they have visited. And if there was time, maybe another neighborhood that they visited also to continue to practice the art of hosting 
and the art of visiting. And so on day two, I will show them that, that, that drawing and I will say today we're going to unravel the survival knot and the survival knot is where your toughest neighborhood in your entire world in relationship meets your toughest neighborhood in your entire world in this relationship. And now I will present to you the roadmap as if you are the couple. And what I'll do is give you the map I give the couple before we actually enter the territory. Clearly, the map is not the territory, but I present this map so that they can see where we are going and so that they can ask all the questions they have so that once we enter it, we're on the way. So I say the first little square here is the square of naming what is the toughest neighborhood for you in this relationship? What has been the hardest place? What have you struggled with all these years, but you have to come up with one word? And so the first challenge is to give one word to a pattern that's been there now for years and years and years. It could be the neighborhood of rejection. It could be the neighborhood of abandonment. It could be the neighborhood of, I'm inferior. It could be the neighborhood of conflict. The, I'm going to ask you, you are now the couple, to find one word that defines a pattern that's been a nightmare for you. And when that's done, then I say, we're going to go to the next part of this map, which is choosing who is the first host. Because you'll notice that intuitively, when there is, let's say, rejection and abandonment, and abandonment and rejection, you will intuitively know where it's going to be easier to begin to unravel this tangle. You know, when you have a tangled ball, there's always a little piece of string that comes out there. And intuitively, you will know. And I really want you to know that couples do know. Where is it better to start? Where will it unravel more easily? And you'll make a choice. Once that choice is made, the person who starts as a host will invite their partner. And what I will do is I will have them step into their body as in, with closed eyes to imagine themselves inside of that neighborhood because our experiences are visceral. Our experiences are in our body. They're not a concept. They are visceral body sensations. And I will have the host go into their body, do a body scan and connect with every part of their body that has a sensation that's associated with that neighborhood. And then open the gate and let their partner in there. Welcome them in there. And that's when they open their eyes, invite their partner, and we start the visit. Now the host will in five words or less begin to say the truth that they live inside of that neighborhood. When you have to say five words or less, you really get to the essence. And now I say to them, look, once you say four things or even five, you're going to get to a little bowl where whatever you say after that, it's the same thing. It's going to be in blue, in yellow, in red, but it will be the same thing. And that's really why it's been a dance, because it's been the same thing for a long, long time. Today, you can't say the same thing. When you get to that little ball, I'm going to be writing everything you say. If I notice it's the same, I'm just going to say it's the same. You will notice also it's the same. Today, you're going to say something deeper, stronger, more vulnerable, more authentic. And what you're going to notice is that when you go at a deeper level, a more authentic level, a more vulnerable level, 
it's going to be like popcorn. Suddenly, that dimension of your relationship will emerge and you will say some truth you've never been able to say. And sometimes you'll even feel, is it okay to say that? But yes, it's not international be nice day. It's international unravel the survival day. So whatever shows up, your job is just to say it in five words or less. Your partner is here to visit you and learn you. You speak it. And then you're going to get to a ball. And that ball is, I don't know. Because if you said everything you know, and if you said everything you did know but didn't say before, you will get to I don't know. And I don't know is a wonderful place because nothing new emerges from knowing. It emerges from not knowing, but not knowing in connection. And that was what occurs at that little ball is you get to not know in connection with your partner. And when you don't know, you grab the first thing that comes. What is interesting is that what begins to emerge is what you didn't know that you didn't know, but that begins to liberate you. And as it, you say those things, you will inevitably arrive at what I call the main square. The main square is a statement that is life-affirming, life-giving, coherent, that you haven't been able to say for all the reasons you haven't been able to say it, actually, from the time you were a little child. It is a deep truth that liberates your being. And I just want to give you one example was of a woman who started with the neighborhood of hate, I hate you. After the little ball, she got to actually, I hate myself. From there, she got to I don't know, and from I don't know to really I'm scum. She went to the ultimate place of self-hatred. And then to I don't know, and suddenly out of that woman came a statement that none of us really expected. I am a radiant being woven in the womb of God. Where does that statement come from? Well, there is a theory called the you theory. And the you theory by Otto Scharmer says that you will never hear the future call you unless you have the courage to go down the you to the bottom, bottom place of that you and back up the you. Because once you get to the bottom, the future will inevitably call you. And the future calls you with life affirming, life giving coherent statements. And I've uh, done this now with so many couples. Inevitably, if people have the courage to actually go down that you to the ultimate, most difficult place I've actually never expressed, the you turns and the future begins to call. That's the main square. Once we get to the main square, we will sit there for a while on a bench in the sun and on a bench that has a plaque, a radiant being in the womb of God could be the plaque. And we will just sit there together because when we get to Main Square, there are lots of emotions that come up and also sometimes a song, a psalm, a poem, because poems, psalms, and songs are written about these main square statements. When we're done there, we're going to go to the next rectangle, which I call core reason. It is essential that I say this to you today because, and you speak the core reason of your life. Why are you in, why were you born? Why are you in this relationship? Why do you have a family? What are you doing on this planet? And out of this core statement, let's say the one about radiant being in the womb of God, what is it that your life is all about? And you will then explore something that can become a mantra. Because our family really is a family of men, we live on this planet 
to give each other love, to give each other understanding, to be coherent humans together in connection, and to pass on a really big legacy to the next generation. Whatever the mantra becomes, it is different for each one of us, but it is important once this liberating statement has come out of us to be able to speak our core, core uh, purpose on this earth. I think I was born to talk to you right now and to really speak the possibility of deep connection and liberation from our survival dance into the full humans that we are in freedom with each other, deeply, deeply connected, not just to each other, but to our full potential. Once that's done, the couple is in a completely new place just from having gone from the toughest neighborhood to the main square, to the core reason. We do the learning, relearning, the surprise, the intrigue, a break. And then we come into a very big expanse. I call it the implicit memory. The implicit mem memory, as opposed to explicit memory, is the memory we don't fully remember. The explicit memory are the things we know, when it happened, who it happened with, why it happened, where we were, who was with us. Everything is explicit there. And our narrative, the narrative of our journey is woven with explicit memories. However, there are so many implicit memories, memories we do not remember, that live in us and trigger us. There is a wonderful saying that was coined by a friend called Irv Milowitz, and he said, the past is a silent voter in our apparent present. It is a silent voter. We don't hear the voting, and yet our present isn't really our present because there's a silent voter deciding upon it. And so that big new square will be to discover the silent voter and actually tell that voter, no, you can't vote anymore. And how do we do that part? So it's very interesting. How do we grab that implicit memory? And to grab the implicit memory, we do something very interesting. We trick the brain. The host invites the visitor to come and begins to say, look, it's important. I say all this to you, to you today. And then the host goes to the part of the brain that processes numbers and location. We are here in Washington, D.C., on 16th Street, a mile from the White House, which is on Pennsylvania, 1600. My phone number is 202-827-3848. Backwards, it's 8483. And I allow the host to just go from place to place to place with numbers backwards, forwards. And then I say, because when I was a child and they grab their, they grab their first random memory, we go with five random memories. So we treat the brain every time going to places and locations and numbers and then grab a memory. And what's so amazing that if you grab five random memories, you get a story of your life you've never seen before. What happens with those five memories is that the partner, the visitor, is going to tell the story. Once upon a time, there was a little girl, there was a little boy, and they weave chronologically, they didn't come out chronologically, but they weave chronologically the five stories. And when those are woven, an archetypical story shows up. A story of a, a girl, a story of a boy, a story we didn't know about ourselves. Often, what really shows up are our strengths and resources that live in us, our spontaneity, our, our playfulness, our intelligence, the resources we have to transcend. Many resources show up in the implicit that don't show up in the story we tell. Because the story we tell in explicit memory is often woven from the difficulty and the trauma and the places of deep, deep, 
pain because we remember them. The implicit has a lot of the things we actually don't remember that has our strengths and our resources in them. And so by the time that story is out, that archetypical story, because we're not alone with that story. Many, many, many girls have that story. Many, many, many boys have that story. Suddenly, we're part of humanity with our big narrative. That's when the partner, the visitor, takes a time machine and goes back to one of the very meaningful moments in the story and talks to the mom, talks to the dad, and talks to the little partner who might be at this point seven years old and says, you know, I've come from the, from the future. And one day, you know what? You're going to marry me and I'm going to marry you. I'm going to fall in love with you. And I've come on this special day because such and such has happened. And I really just want you to know who you're going to be in the future. And the partner speaks to the reality of what occurred and says the very things that a champion, a true champion would say. Now what's beautiful is the part of our brain that listens, which is our limbic system, is atemporal. It doesn't know that this is our partner. It knows a champion has just stepped into our home and is saying the things I've been longing to hear forever and ever and ever. And a bonding occurs between the grown-up visiting partner and the little child who's been waiting for this champion to show up forever. And this encounter, grown-up partner, young child, becomes something photographed in the brain. We will never be alone there again. And so we stay there as long as we need. The question becomes, have I said everything to everyone you'd like for me to talk to because I'm here with a time machine and I can stay for as long as you want. And sometimes the child will send this uh, messenger with a message to dad that he, that he or she couldn't think about, a message to mom, a message to the self, but also a message maybe to a grandmother that didn't show up in the story, but is so important in the child's life, or a message to a teacher that didn't show up in the story, but is so important in the child's life. So we take as much time as needed so that all the messages that need to be given to the child, for the child, as a champion and an advocate can be given. And when that's done, the visitor will say, so now I'm going to go back to the future where I'm going to meet you. And I'm going to give you, if you permit me, a very big kiss on your forehead, a kiss you'll never forget. And then I'll meet you on this particular day in the future. Now, what's really amazing is that very often the child part of us cannot let that wonderful champion go. No, don't go, don't leave. And that's a very special moment in which really that sense of, I'll never be alone here again, somebody really joined me, gets deeply in, embedded in the brain. And then the partner gives that very special kiss on the forehead and the time machine, comes back to the present, the partners look at each other, and the host will say, thank you for visiting me there. What touched me the most when you came to be with me there? And they let their partner know. And then the visitor says, well, tell, thank you for inviting me there, and what touched me the most? And these are very new connections that the two are making that they've never made before. And what has occurred with this champion stepping into the past and being this really very liberating champion is that the fuel that 
was there before that fueled that tough neighborhood has been dissolved. And that's the point of staying there in that home for as long as needed because you want to dissolve the fuel that uh, that fuels really the neighborhood. When that part is finished, the couple will take their books and they will look at a learning, a relearning, a surprise, an intrigue that has come out of this piece of the journey. When we're done with that, it's lunchtime. When lunchtime is over, we're starting that whole process again on the other side. Each part of the journey takes about an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. So it's about three hours per person. Now what's very interesting is that the new research on the brain shows us that there is a window of opportunity where the brain stays open. And when there is a juxtaposition of the old belief, the one, the survival belief, with a completely new reality in which we receive, see, hear, experience something completely different than what the belief will have us live, that when that occurs in juxtaposition, the brain has an error detection mechanism and it will grab the truth rather than the lie we felt we had to buy. A wonderful book that describes this is called Memory Reconsolidation by Ecker, Tissick, and Holly. It is a book of research on the way the brain transforms in those events. And that, that window of opportunity when the brain is really open is a window of five hours. And so this particular visit that takes about three, three to four hours on one side, three, three to four hours on the other side, gives the brain exactly those conditions of juxtaposition of the old way of thinking and the new way that shows up as a part of a new reality. And the research shows that in times like this, as the brain has that error detection mechanism chooses the new reality, our brain rewires in vivo. So that this particular unraveling of the survival knot is a way of reconsolidating memory. It was consolidated one way, it reconsolidates another way. And the couple is really in a new place with a brain that's been sculpted by each other into new wiring. When that's done, and the books now, their journals are full of new learnings and, and relearnings and surprises and intrigues, we're doing one more thing. And that thing is to create the map for the new neighborhood under construction. This couple des des deserves to create a completely new neighborhood under construction. And they actually draw the map in their books that has this avenue and that boulevard and this cafe and that library and this lake and this park that, that gives them a chance to walk a map that has all the new elements, the elements that are coherent with their new relationship so that they can make this map a work in progress and continue to build from there. That's the end of that unraveling of the survival knot. This is the map that I just described to you. And the way that I complete the two-day session is with a gratitude ritual in which the couple invites each other to express 
the gratitude they have for their partner starting from the very first time they laid eyes on each other. The host will invite the visitor for four consecutive minutes in which they just go, I'm grateful to you for, I'm grateful to you for, I'm grateful to you for. And then the partner will look at that whole basket of goodies and pick out their three favorites and then it goes on the other side. And this particular way of ending the two-day adventure allows the couple to see one more neighborhood in the world of their partner, which is the neighborhood of unlimited gratitude. So I'm going to put a semicolon here. Clearly, this is just a piece of the journey. And I am going to pass it back on here to Jeffrey, who is going to now uh, talk to you to finish up our webinar here today. I salute you all, and I thank you for your deep attention. To you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Aidy. So I want to thank you all for being with us today. Um, later today, I'll be sending you a few items. Uh, one, you'll receive a recording of this webinar. You'll also receive uh, Hades bio with a link to our resource center. And then you'll also receive the code for your $100 scholarship towards the Couples Journey Workshop, which is on October 19th to 21st in Washington, D.C. Uh, this scholarship is valid for you and your partner, as well as for your clients. And there's 21 CEUs for therapists are available for attending the couples workshop in October. I also want to announce to you that Haiti will be, will be presenting a hybrid workshop session on November 17th and 18th in Washington, DC. Uh, the hybrid is a combination of the couples workshop and a private session for six couples. And finally, Haiti is available for her two day private sessions for one couple in Washington, D.C., and by invitation to the area where the couple lives. You will find more information and registration for these upcoming events at HeidiYumi.com, or you can give me a call at 305-604-0010. Thank you again for joining Haiti today for the webinar on Unraveling Your Survival Knot of Couples. I'm wishing you all a great day. Thank you.